Um, all right. So I think we can start. So next up, we have uh, Amadur Pahim talking about the SRE tail, taking um, 100k calls per hour to the GitHub API. Um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, the presentation today intends to go through our process of developing a service that enabled us to get to that number, uh, 100K calls per hour to the GitHub API. So, but I, I want to start that um, that tale with the topic of GitOps, right? Because uh, the year is 2019. And back then we had uh, a teammate at Red Hat, uh, Jaime, uh, he gave a presentation at DevConf uh, US as well, back in Boston. Um, and he was uh, going through the, the implementation that led the application SRE team at Red Hat uh, using GitOps, led the team to have uh, a massive uh, scalability uh, achievement in terms of um, how much workload we can take into the infrastructure persistent piece, right? So uh, I, I advise you all to go watch that presentation. It's on YouTube. You can just look it up. But back then, he was uh, showing us how the, GitO the GitOps infrastructure and implementation enabled the team to scale up to 17 services um, being controlled by that uh, GitOps infrastructure. And also back then, he mentioned we had already 22 reconcile loops. And those reconcile loops, they are uh, integrations. They are control loops that are getting data from the GitOps repository and persisting, uh, persisting them into the infrastructure. Uh, in the next slide, I have a, a bit more detailed view in that infrastructure. So we have the tenants down here that are providing um, merge requests and proposing change to the Git uh, repository that contains the, the, the GitOps base. And every time something is merged in there, that gets bundled um, as a package into an S3 bucket. That S3 bucket is actually the data backend for a web service deployed on Kubernetes on an OpenShift cluster. Uh, that deployment uh, will use the data coming from the GitOps uh, repository and expose that data through a GraphQL API uh, using a Kubernetes service. And then we have all the reconcile loops that are using, consuming that information from uh, that GraphQL API um, and considering that the desired state and propagating that desired state into all the uh, infrastructure pieces that we talked to. Uh, for example, we have a reconcile loop creating namespaces uh, or creating uh, Kubernetes objects. We have also reconcile loops talking to uh, GitHub API to create organizations to manage users and permissions and that kind of stuff. So all those reconcile loops, they also can be sharded so we can actually have multiple instances of the same reconcile loop, each of them uh, processing a slice of the data that's coming from that GitOps repository. Uh, so that, that, that whole infrastructure, what, the, um, what it brought to us was uh, um, a very high capacity to scale, uh, to horizontally scale the infrastructure um, of persisting uh, configuration into the infrastructure, right? Uh, so with that, the tenants, our tenants, our internal development teams that need um, infrastructure um, artifacts or uh, configuration, they would come to that GitOps repository, will do some um, specification of what they need in this example here. Tenants uh, 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 are willing to create a QA repository. After that configuration change gets merged, after a few minutes, they will have the query repository created by the reconcile loop. So uh, the interface is well defined. There is a reconcile loop that will give that to us. And we can create as many reconcile loops as we want to automate whatever piece of infrastructure that we need. Uh, with that in place, we fast forward to uh, 2021. So currently we have more than um, 120 services configured into that platform. Uh, many of them already fully onboarded uh, for the uh, to the SRE team that are supported. Um, we also have more than 120 reconcile loops 
uh, that's that's also a big role uh, considered uh, uh, compared to 2019 because each of those loops are doing a different thing, are doing a different piece of automation, right? And with all that in place, what it meant for uh, us was that we got more than 25,000 uh, merge requests as of today to the GitOps repository because we uh, advocate for a self-service uh, uh, initiative, right? The internal development teams, they come to that repository to propose change that will reflect uh, will be reflected in the infrastructure later on. Uh, so when you have all that in place uh, and you have solved the scalability issue in the infrastructure automation piece, uh, you will start basically transferring the bottleneck to the next layer, right? Well, whatever API you are uh, you are talking to, if you talk too much to that API, you will have a bottleneck happening in that next layer. And that brings us to the problem that we started facing with GitHub, which is uh, the fact that we started um, exhausting the rate limit in that specific API, right? The GitHub API, because we have, um, we do a lot of requests to check if uh, the data that's in there is the desired state when compared to our uh, GitOps um, uh, code base. Uh, because we do that too often and from too many integrations, we started exhausting that rate limit that it's imposed by, by that API. Uh, it's not, uh, of course, many APIs can impose rate limits, but GitHub is quite critical for us because we have a lot of uh, reconciliation loops that are doing communication to that API. And I'm listing here in this slide, um, we have uh, six uh, reconcile loops, different reconcile loops as of now, that are doing different stuff to the GitHub API. GitHub uh, repo invites to take care of invitations to our bot account and well, GitHub org, GitHub owners, managing organizations, uh, teams, uh, users, all that, uh, each, each of those will be an independent reconcile loop. And also each of these independent reconcile loop can be sharded uh, uh, to any number of instances. So we can not really have a high load going towards that API. And when we looked up the GitHub API uh, rate limit uh, documentation, what we found out there is that they have a limit of 5,000 requests per hour uh, if, you, if you're if you using uh, OAuth uh, or base authentication against that API. And if you are not authenticated, the, the rate limit is uh, way lower than that. It's just 60 calls per hour. But for authenticated requests, which is our case, uh, the limit uh, as of now is 5,000 requests per hour. And in this slide here, I'm just um, exposing to you the headers that come back from those requests to the GitHub API. When you do some requests, you get some response from it. And, and with that response, you have a set of headers. And I'm highlighting here the rate limit um, uh, total and remaining counter that comes back from the API. So from those headers, you can have a perspective on how, how many more uh, calls you can make uh, within the hour to that uh, GitHub API, right? So uh, before we go into the exact implementation of the system that helped us there, um, a bit of the anatomy of our API calls. We do those API calls every two minutes. Uh, so by that, what I mean is that every reconcile loop we have is executed every two minutes. And it takes some time to complete, but after it completes and after two minutes, it will be executed again. Mostly it deals with unchanged data, right? The data on the GitHub side that doesn't change a lot, like users' permissions or organizations. It's not that every time we reconcile, uh, the data will be different. It's the other way around. Most of the times, most of the time data uh, doesn't change. Uh, but when it does change, we need to react fast to that changed data, right? Because it typically means that we are trying to persist something that's already merged into our GitOps repository, and we have to make sure to reflect that into the infrastructure. So we have to react fast to that uh, changed data. And we have also contracts to our tenants where we say, well, we will reconcile your um, change proposed to the, 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 the GitOps repository within uh, a given amount of time. So we have to uh, comply with those contracts. 
And by the time that we started this project, we were uh, making around from six to 8,000 calls per hour to the GitHub API. So we were already a bit beyond the 5,000 calls limit. Of course, if you do some optimizations and you change a bit your code, you can reduce that number. But um, we, we, we were like uh, following or trying to come up with a solution that would also uh, unlock uh, us in terms of scalability there. And the alternatives considered to um, get around that issue, uh, first and the most like uh, obvious one, pay for more calls, right? If you have some subscription or some uh, paid uh, service or option that will let you do more calls, that's the first thing you should be doing. Uh, but that's uh, when we looked that up, it was still limited, right? Even if you pay for some enterprise subscription or if you manage to grow the rate limit for your uh, user accounts, you, you are just postponing the issue, right? You are, uh, you, you'll be soon, uh, sooner or later, you'll be hitting the new limit that that's imposed by that new level of, of subscription you have. And there was no such thing as unlimited API calls. Uh, so the second option that we considered was to create additional users, right? Because those API calls are per user basis. Um, if you can make five, thousand calls per user and you have multiple users, you can, I don't know, load, um, load balance the, 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 the calls, uh, sharding the users. You can come up with some mechanisms around that, but there's a lot of management overhead and uh, it, it's hard to horizontally scale a scenario like that where you have to create new users and all that. It, uh, sharding mechanism and, and that typically means that you are being a bad citizen um, against that API, right? You, you should not be like faking that you, you are multiple users. And in fact, you are the same user. You're just using that to get around some limitations. So uh, there might be something better, right? And we started looking into the documentation of GitHub API and we found the conditional request implementation that they do. Uh, actually, the conditional requests are specified by RFC 7232 and they do implement that in the GitHub API. And what's very interesting about conditional requests there is that every time you request something to the API, you get together with the response in the response headers, uh, header that uniquely identifies that resource. And uh, every time that that resource is different, that uh, identifier uh, called here e tag, that e tag will change if the content of that resource has changed. Uh, so every time you make a request to a resource, if you ship with your request that e tag that you received before when you get the response uh, if the resource hasn't changed you get a 304 from the api instead of a 200 and that 304 is telling you well the resource is the same use what you had got taken before because that that's uh, current data right and the important thing about those 304s that we get from the api is that they they won't um, consume from the rate limit, they, they they don't count against the rate limit. So you can safely make those requests, get the response saying that, that the data is the same, and then you go ahead with life without having consumed anything from the rate limit, uh, rate limit quota. Uh, this is just a bit more detailed uh, representation of that flow. Whenever you do a get full bar into the API, the API, if this is the first call, the API will give you a 200. That 200 will have um, the content of that response, of course, and that counts against the rate limit, but it also ships with a header called e tag, and that header has this unique uh, identifier. Next time you do a request to the same resource, and if you ship that request with the if non match uh, header, and the value of that uh, e tag you, you got before, and the resource is the same, you get a 304 with the same e tag, no content, and it doesn't count against the, the rate limit. And I'm just proving uh, that you work with the GitHub API with this code snippet here. Um, I'm doing a request against the GitHub API. I got the 200, there's content, there's the e tag header. Next time I do the same request against the same uh, URL, but this time shipping with the value of the e tag, 
in the if non match uh, header. And what I get from it is a 304 with no content in the response. So that, that really works uh, with the GitHub API. So next up, how can we use that to uh, make a better usage of the rate limit that we have? The first thing that we considered was to uh, make the conditional request implementation in the client libraries that we uh, use to query the GitHub API, right? But the problem with that solution is that, well, first you have to uh, rewrite or to add features to the, the client libraries. And some client libraries are not developed by us, so you have to contribute to those libraries, um, whatever community that's developed on. Uh, so that, that would also impose us a, a bigger uh, turnaround to get that done. Uh, but most importantly, the, the fact that if you implement that in the client and you don't share the, the, the cache responses that you get from the API, it means that each instance of your automation will have a separate uh, cache for the responses and that there will be a lot of duplication of data. And so what we came up with uh, at the time was to create a service called GitHub Mirror. And the service uh, basically will be acting as a proxy to the GitHub API. All the clients will, will, will do API calls against that new service instead of doing it directly to the GitHub API. Uh, so the goals of the project, right, it's an API mirror that caches the responses and implements the conditional requests. It supports both in-memory and also Redis cache backends. Uh, it has an offline mode, which detects when the GitHub API is down. And when that's the case, it switches to a mode that will serve all the content directly from cache. So um, outages in the GitHub API, they are mostly unnoticeable by the clients. It, it has low footprint. It's easy to get started with, easy to scale out, written in Python. It's highly tested. And it's a community project, open source. It's in GitHub. So to start using GitHub Mirror, uh, it's very easy. You just call Podman, run the Docker image that we we have there with Podman or Docker. Um, and it will be uh, your local instance of GitHub Mirror uh, running out of the box, right? And after you do that, you start making requests against that URL instead of doing the request directly to the GitHub API. And even though I'm doing the request uh, twice here and I'm getting 200 um, in both of them with content, with everything, it means that the client doesn't have to deal with the conditional request because that um, piece in between, which is the GitHub mirror, is doing that for you. So you see that the first request got a cache miss which uh, means that the, the response was not cached before, but for the second one, we got a cache hit, which means that we served that from cache because the GitHub API gave to the GitHub mirror a 304. So GitHub mirror was able to serve that request from cache and that saved, well, saved us one API call from the, from the rate limit. Uh, talking a little bit about client support, um, we use mainly request module and also PyGitHub with the request. Well, it's straightforward. You just have to point to a different URL. But with the PyGitHub, they also support the base URL um, argument to the GitHub class. And with that, you can just point the requests made by um, that library to a different uh, URL. And that will also work out of the box. So zero implementation was um, needed on the client side other than just adjust, adjust the URLs that we are um, coding against, right? Um, this is just a little bit more uh, visual representation of what I just described. The client will talk to GitHub Mirror all the time. It will get uh, 200s all the time, always with content. So no awareness about um, conditional requests on the client side. And the GitHub mirror is the component doing the conditional request against the API. For the first request, it's, it, it follows the normal flow. For the, for the second request, it will see that there is already a response for that resource in cache. And it will get the e tag from the response header to put it in the next request. It will get the, it will get the, the 304 from the API and it will serve that request from cache with a 200. So that's 
just another way of seeing that flow happening. So that brought us, uh, the, the first was, uh, the, the, the service was first um, rolled out to production in April 2020. And when we started using that service, we already started with 10,000 K calls per hour. And two months later, we got you, because we, of course, unlocked that limitation from our perspective, we got you 30,000 calls uh, per hour to the GitHub API. And today we've been consistently crossing the 100,000 calls per hour uh, in peak hours when we have more uh, automations kicking in for different reasons. But one very important um, number that I, I would like to highlight in this slide is the number of cache misses we have per hour. In this case, even though we made 100,000 calls to the GitHub API, only 100 of them were uh, counting against the rate limit, right? Because only 100 of them uh, got something not 304 from the API, probably a 200 uh, saying, well, there, here's the new data. And so that, that brought us to a very uh, low level in terms of how many calls we make that actually count against that rate limit, allowing us to scale massively in that perspective. Um, the deployment of the GitHub Mirror service uh, is a simple Kubernetes deployment. And guess what? We, we just use the GitOps um, repository to define everything that we need for that service. Uh, namespace, uh, it has five replicas. And we also have uh, Redis backend. It's, uh, it's using Elastic Cache on AWS. Uh, we have three nodes, cache T, uh, T3 small, primary, uh, one primary and two replicas. And all those pods are using the Redis backend to, to, uh, as a caching uh, backend, right? Um, here's um, a sneak peek into the OpenShift um, console for the GitHub mirror deployment. You can see that we have five uh, pods there, each of them 100 uh, megabytes um, of memory, very low CPU footprint. It's a very uh, slim service, very easy to run, and it, it scales very well. You can have any number of replicas you want. There's no a hard uh, constraint there. Uh, so. Just a couple of words uh, uh, around the Redis uh, cache backend. To enable it, you just have to set some uh, environment variable pointing to Redis. And when you do that, you also want to specify the primary endpoint, reader endpoint, uh, port, password, well, everything that it, it, it's needed for um, connecting to the Redis backend. When you have that, uh, though, when you have those environment variables all set, uh, GitHub Mirror will, will use Redis to for the cache out of the box instead of using an in-memory data structure. The problem with the in-memory data structure is that if you have two replicas, each of them will have uh, a separate cache. It's not shared between all the replicas of the service. And that's why we created the, the Redis cache backend for it or implemented the, the code part to use the Redis as cache backend. So some... Um, data from the monitoring we have to the service. Uh, this is the aggregated CPU usage for all the five uh, replicas. This is the aggregated memory usage. And one very important uh, piece of information as well is the latencies graph. You see that what, what we measure here is how long it takes from when the request from the client gets into the GitHub mirror service until we send a response to the client. So. The, the, the time it takes considers looking up the cache, talking to the GitHub API, uh, potentially uh, writing data to the cache again, and then sending a response to the client. Um, we, we, and you can see here that P95 is below, well below 0 0.4 seconds, and P99 um, well below 0 0.6 seconds. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, efficient service. And we try to keep those numbers uh, as we go forward. Uh, the offline mode, uh, there, are some also, uh, there are some metrics that represent the offline mode or when it kicks in. You see that there's this green uh, peaks here. It means that the offline mode started kicking in because of some outage in the GitHub API. So what happened to us was that by using this service, 
uh, we became more reliable than the GitHub API itself because when it goes offline, we just keep serving stuff from cache and things just work for the clients, right? Uh, a few issues that's worth mentioning, um, but the, 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 the main issues we had were related to the content or to the headers that come back from the API having also URLs to the api.github.com, which means that if the client used that information to make a new request, it will skip the GitHub mirror and go direct to the GitHub API. So we had to do some URL rewriting to have that also, uh, well, fixed from the client perspective. Uh, just the last slide again, uh, um, sorry about uh, the roadmap. Uh, we want to serve uh, from cache when we have not only outages in the API, but also when we have errors coming back from the 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 the, the, the actual API .github .com, uh, which means that on 500s we serve from cache not only when the API uh, when there there are some outages in the API. We want to also improve the offline detection because uh, right now sometimes the API is not really behaving and we don't detect it offline. We just tell it, it it's still working. So the clients keep get, getting errors from the API. And also we want uh, to use those client requests to the API to flag that the API is down. So it's all connected. It's, uh, it's all about making sure we can detect when the API is not uh, working as expected. And as a last topic, multi-tenancy metrics awareness, because right now we only show metrics as the accumulated for all the users that are using that service. And we want to split those metrics per user basis. Uh, yeah, that's all I had. I think we still have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, here's the... Uh, GitHub mirror, uh, GitHub well uh, repository URL. You can go there and check it out, and feel free to reach me out if you want to. Um, yeah, discuss further the topic. Thank you so much for um, <clears throat> sharing the information with us and talking to us. Um, I'm just waiting on seeing if there are any questions that we have for you. And you see, and it seems like your presentation is probably flawless. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's that, that's <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for for joining, and yeah, thank you for having me here. Thank you so much.